Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Auditing Culture, Red Flag Approach. My name is Jim Kaplan, President and Founder of AuditNet, the global resource for auditors. The webinar today is being brought to you by Teammate. Before I turn the floor over to, to Toby to introduce himself and the agenda, I'd like to briefly cover the housekeeping items. The webinar is being recorded today and you will receive a a link to that recording. It will be sent to the address that you use to, to register with. Uh, the views expressed by the presenters do not necessarily represent the views, positions, or opinions of AuditNet or the presenters' respective organization. You can submit questions via the chat box on your screen. We look forward to getting your questions. And just as a reminder, we have uh, more than a thousand people that registered for today's webinar and will have a very robust attendance so please be patient if you post a question and it's not answered right away those questions that we can't answer during the webinar we will try to follow up and answer after the webinar is over we are operating under NASBA rules NASBA rules do require us to ask polling questions during the webinar CPE certificates will be sent via email to those who answer all the polling questions the CPE certificates and the recordings will be sent to the email address that you registered with in GoToWebinar. After the webinar is over, you will get a link to a, an evaluation. Uh, please take time to fill out that evaluation so we can improve our webinars for future presenters. At this point, I'd like to turn the floor over to Toby DeRoche to cover his background and also to get into today's topic of auditing culture, a red flag approach. Toby? Thank you, Jim. Um, so just so you guys know who I am, like Jim said, my name is Toby DeRoche. I am a market development consultant with Teammates. Um, we provide technology solutions to auditors for control management, audit management, and data analytics. Um, my background is all internal audit. I was an internal audit manager uh, for a Fortune 100 corporation before coming to work with teammates. Um, everything we're going to be going through today really is going to be new topics that we're all, we're all going through and trying to understand how to approach. The reason why we're talking about culture today is really because the IA has shined a light on it. They've been focusing more and more on the need for an internal audit department to start to assess the culture of our organization. And there's lots and lots of different um, articles that have been coming out on this. And one of the things that's really uh, a common theme through all of them is that they're vague. They don't give us a lot of specific guidance on how to approach the topic of audit and culture. And that's really what we want to get through today is going to be showing you an approach. Um, it's still a very new topic, so things are going to change over time. But in the short term, we want to pre pre present you with, with a methodology to approach uh, a cultural audit within your organization that you can take away right now. While we're going through this, we're also going to touch on the subjective nature of these types of audits and some of the unique challenges that come with documenting the, the issues that we find and reporting on these issues and really dealing with them as an organization. Specific objectives that we have for today are going to be to understand those challenges to understand what makes a, a cultural audit different. And to start with that, we're going to have to understand what culture is. So we're going to start there. We're also going to talk about um, a specific methodology that we're going to call a red flag of this topic. And we're going to cover at the end some challenges that come around writing these kinds of issues down, so on documentation as well as on reporting. The very end, again, this is a very new topic, so we're all still learning about how to approach it. I want to leave you with some other resources. It's the ones that I found to be the best as you know, researching through this topic and getting ready for a presentation, you know, just to talk with everyone here. Um, it's the ones that I found that added the most value. So I'm going to point those out as well so that you have some resources on where to go next. Like Jim said, we want to encourage questions on this one. So if you have any questions as we're going through, feel free to post them into the webinar. Uh, so that we can address them. We've included some time to address the questions as much as possible. Now just to get us started, I want to get a, take, a, take a baseline of where everybody is and understand what you've done so far. So our first question, just to start us off, is going to be, have you added a quote-unquote cultural component to your audit plan? 
not necessarily a culture audit or something formal, but anything, anything at all that addresses culture in your audit plan. So yes, you have for your current plan. You have, but you're pushing it off to later. So you're doing this maybe next year. Or you haven't done it yet, or you're just not sure. We'll leave the poll open for about a minute. Uh, the poll is open now, and as soon as we have the majority of uh, people voting, we will close the poll. We're currently at 91%. In order to receive CPE, you must answer all of the polling questions, so please take a moment to answer the polling question. About another 10 seconds. And we will go ahead and we will close the poll now. And before I share the results, Toby, it looks like we've got a question here. What if a culture is dysfunctional or criminal? We're going to talk about it, for sure. We're going to talk about how to write those things down. Good. Definitely. Okay. Well, there's the, the results of the poll. So, Toby, if you want to discuss that briefly. Mm -hmm. So it looks like from the results, we've got about 17% or so who have addressed it, 4% uh, who are looking at it maybe for next year. The vast majority have not yet touched this. So about 65% haven't gotten into what a cultural audit might look like. And that's exactly what we expect, because there's some guidance out there, so some early adopters have taken it on. But for the majority of us, we, we haven't approached it yet. We might not even know where to start. So my goal for this is really to give you a starting point. To do that, we're going to have to define what we're talking about. Um, you can't audit a thing unless you know what it is. So let's talk about what culture really means. We're going to look at this in two different ways. And first is going to be basic textbook definition of what is culture from an organizational point of view. Um, I got this one from a textbook from college, sitting on my, on my bookshelf. It's been there for years. And the definitions never change. It's always something like this. It's a shared social knowledge within an organization regarding the rules, the norms, and the values that shape our attitudes and behaviors of employees. And it's those two words that jump out attitudes and behaviors, because if I'm looking at this from an auditor's perspective, I'm being asked to audit attitude and behavior. And that is such a foreign concept of how, how would I even approach that? Because it sounds like a very invasive thing to start to audit someone's attitude. So then I went to look out for something else. I went for a real world definition. And this one is from Norman Marx, who many of you know. Um, Norman Marx does a lot of, of publishing with the IIA, puts out a, a, a wealth of information through his blogs. He does seminars around the world. Um, he's a fantastic resource. In one of his blogs recently, this was his definition, he said that all observers have their own interpretation of what the term culture means. It's commonly interpreted, interpreted as the way we do things around here. So if we put these two things together, and we're looking at the way we do things, we're trying to involve attitudes and behaviors, Ultimately, what I think that culture is going to be for our perspective is going to be three elements. It's going to be the processes that we follow every single day. It's the behaviors that we exhibit, specifically when things are really good and really bad. It's on the extremes of, of, of experience that we really see how people's behavior shows itself. And finally, it's the attitudes that we have specifically toward our job, our coworkers and our customers, and that these three things make up what we do around here. The good news is we're, we're a third of the way through it because we already audit process all the time. That we know how to do. So then we're just tackling behaviors and attitudes, and if we add some definition around what those are, we can get a better understanding of how to approach them. And the reason this is important is really highlighted by a recent survey from the IIA. Um, Pulse of Internal Audit Survey gets pu published every year. Um, you've probably participated in it. The IA publishes it out to all of us all the time. Two of the biggest factors that they had that were influencing culture. Oops. 
behavior modeled by executive management, and behavior modeled by everybody else. Those two behavioral things were really what drove an, organizational, an organization's culture. That first one, behavior by executive management, that sounds like tone at the top. Behavior by everybody else is culture. That's how we all act. So what really drives an organization's culture is it's the model that's set by management and the way that we all act around it. The trick is it's going to be different everywhere. So you might have an, an overall overarching culture for your organization. And it's, it's the, the typical way that things are acting, the typical way we do things, those behaviors and attitudes that we see across our entire organization. But there's going to be a lot of nuances within it because there's going to be differences when you get down to the department level. Some departments have a different culture than others. There's differences between lines of business. There's differences between regions, especially if you're in a global organization. There's differences from country to country, from city to city. There's differences everywhere. There's even differences within a department among the people groups in that department. So to just define culture in one way isn't something we can really do. It's something we have to look at all the time. So reading through a lot of the literature that was out there, one of the articles put out by the IA was this one. It's from, from an article called Auditing Culture, A Hard Look at the Soft Stuff. And this was a quote from, from someone, she's on the IA board directors who, who wrote this. She says that auditing culture must be incorporated into every engagement, providing the organization with a baseline for continuous monitoring and enabling us to look for early warning signs. Now the thing that struck me with this, this line is that we're supposed to be including this on every audit to look for early warning signs. And that sounds really familiar. That's the approach we take with fraud. We don't typically set out to perform a fraud investigation. It's something that we're led to. There's some reason that we went down to look at something. We might have done some indicator testing. We might have done something that got us to that point, but that's not how we started. We started with red flag awareness. And it's the same thing here. What we're at being asked to do when we audit culture is we're being asked to have an awareness and look for, for early warning signs or red flags that there might be a problem inside of our culture. Now our approach for this, if we start to take this red flag approach of thinking about culture with just a typical general awareness that there might be a problem, I'm going to suggest we break it into two pieces. We start by trying to incorporate it into our main audit phases. So when we approach red flags for culture issues, we can think about this and how we are treated as an audit department. So think about whenever you go out and work with management, you're engaging with them, and you're going to be going through their processes and look at the way that they do things. And they're going to have a reaction to that. And they're going to have reactions to that throughout the audit. So whenever we first start our audit in the, in the, in the planning phase, there's going to be ways that management reacts. When we're in field work, there's ways that management will react. Same thing throughout the reporting and follow-up phases. Now, your internal phases might look a little bit different. So you might have broken your audits into more pieces, and that's fine. We're just talking in generalities here about how we perform our work. The beauty of doing this as part of every engagement from an audit perspective is that it's directly observable by you and everybody else on staff. The entire audit team is going to have some opinion on this. It's repeatable because you're going to do this every single time you go out the door, on every audit every day. You're going to be seeing things and you can track it for patterns. Now to track it for patterns means you got to write it down. And we're going, to be ha we're going to have a discussion about that in a little bit, about how we write these things down and some of the challenges. But if you don't write it down, you can't track it. You can't look for trends. So you have to. The other place that we're going to talk about this is in specific engagements. And we're going to talk about how we can incorporate red flag indicator testing even, just like we do for fraud. If you're looking at a big data set and you run a Benford test to look for outliers from a pattern, you're looking for fraud indicators. There's similar tests we can run to look at culture. So let's start with planning. We're going to start with the audit side of the house and talk about things that you might be seeing out in your, in your organization. 
So starting with planning, we're just getting our audit going. We've issued an engagement letter, we're planning for a kickoff meeting. Maybe we send out some initial support requests. We're just getting going. How does management act? Are you getting pushback from them before you ever even start? Are they just immediately objecting to this audit? Are they pushing back on the start date? So you sent them an engagement letter that said, we're coming, here's our scope of our audit, here's who we're sending. Did they immediately say, well, nope, I don't want to do this audit now. I need you to push this back. Are they attending a kickoff meeting or do they not even bother to show up? Is there a lack of response to your initial documentation request? These could be red flags that there's going to be a problem. It doesn't mean that there's a problem. Not any issue with one of these doesn't immediately warrant a cultural issue. Because think about what's going on. Maybe they're pushing back on the start date for a reason. Maybe the start date that you picked for this audit it coincides with the financial close period. And they know that their staff's going to be all tied up and they won't be able to help you with, with the work you're trying to do and they don't want to ignore you. So asking to push the date back to be a good partner. Or maybe they haven't gotten you your initial documentation back because they wanted to look at it first. So you sent them all these lists of things that you want to see. They want to look at it before they hand it to you because they don't want any surprises. So the key to all of these are going to be to dig a little bit deeper. Always ask the next question. Just ask why. So they push back on the start date, ask them why. Find out. If they come back and say, because I don't have time for you, maybe that's going to be a red flag indicator. We can look at this from the field work, too. So during field work now, we're going out into the audit. We're digging down deeper into it. We're really starting to look at some of the, the underlying data. We have some initial findings we need to get some follow-up on, help, help us interpret what we're seeing. So what's management's behaviors? Are they blocking your access to the process owners? Your questions are ultimately going to be for the people who do the work. Can you talk to them? Or did management put up a wall and they won't let you even talk to the people who own processes or who have responsibility for specific controls? Whenever you send follow-up questions, do they just go into a black hole? Are you getting any responses back at all? Or are you just being shut down? Whenever you do raise some initial issues up with management, how do they react? Did they they just smile and nod and just go on about their business, or did they actually take it seriously? How are they reacting to the way that you are communicating with them? Are they pushing back unnecessarily? So if you're sitting in, in an update meeting with them and going through your initial findings and trying to talk through what it was that you found and get a better understanding, are they being aggressive? Are they getting in your face and pushing back unnecessarily, or do they want to understand what's going on? Finally, just think about the basic conditions as well. So where did they put you to work? Especially if you're somebody who works um, from, maybe you work from a central office and you go out into the field. Literally, you go to another location. You go to another city. You go out somewhere to do your field work. So now you need a place to work. Where did they put you? So with this one, let me give you, let me give you an example. Um, in my last job in audit, we had a location in Seattle. Uh, home office was in Ohio, so we fly out to Seattle for our engagement. We have our kickoff meeting, and the group that we're auditing is on the sixth floor of this building. That's where the accounting team is. That's where we're, we're going to be. We have our, our kickoff meeting. It was poorly attended. There was one or two people of the six or seven that we invited. They just agree with everything, sort of take our, our, our list of, of requests, and they run away. And then they send somebody to bring us to our, our workspace. Now, we think we're going to be working on the same floor where we are. They take us to an elevator, and we go down to the sub-basement of this building. Not the basement. It's the basement below the basement. Two levels underground. This is November in Seattle. It's cold. It's wet. It's raining nonstop. Right outside the office where we're going to be working, there's literally a little channel dug into the, into the hallway for water to run out of the building. They put us in this room. It's roughly the size of a closet. There's a table pushed against the wall. There's no windows, scuffed up paint, smells musty and gross in the building. 
Um, there's no internet, there's no phone, and there's no cell reception. So we are cut off from everything. The conditions were so bad that after about an hour we left and we went work from a coffee shop down the street. And those two things set the tone of that audit. We knew we weren't going to get good response from management. We knew that they were going to be, be pushing back on everything, they'd be aggressive on the issues, just from the first 10 minutes of getting started. So for us, that was a red flag. We knew immediately that we were going to have some issues. And then you just hope that it doesn't turn out that way, but ultimately you kind of have a feel of what's going to happen. We get through field work. We get through all the work. We've got our issues. We've, we've finalized some things. We're, we're starting to negotiate you know, action plans and, and close out dates for things. Whenever you hand management their report, what was their reaction? Now, not all of us score our audit reports, but for those who do, are, is management are just arguing over the score. They're not looking at the, at the report. They're not focusing on the real meat of what happened in this audit or, or the corrective actions that need to take place to get their, their business back in order. They're focusing on the visual of a score. And this might be something like a number. It might be a rating. It might be like a satisfactory needs improvement. Um, there might be letter scoring. So it would be like if they're taking a test and they got a B and they wanted an A. And they're arguing over the score but not the underlying problems. Even worse, are they punishing their team for having audit issues? We've seen scenarios where because a specific manager over a process had an issue in that process, management comes down on that individual really hard. Still even worse than that is compensation tied to audit results. And this goes both ways. As auditors, we're not, we're not paid to find things. We're not paid by the issue that we find. And out in the business, they shouldn't be docked pay for having issues. We're talking about processes. Just because they had a problem in a process doesn't mean that they're a bad person, doesn't mean that they're a bad manager. Another might be is management trying to send all of their reports for legal review before they even get discussed internally. As auditors, we don't report to legal. And nothing that we write down it should be a secret from the people who, who are performing those processes. So if we're trying to issue a report to people and we want them to see how to make their lives better, how to make their jobs more efficient, none of this should be a secret. None of this should be subjected to legal confidentiality. And finally, are we finding an overuse of the term management accepts the risk? This is something that happens from time to time as well, where we find management just basically saying for every single thing that audit finds, that's just a, that's a minor issue. That's a documentation thing. That's a paperwork issue. That's just some cleanup. Management accepts the risk on all these things. We have to make our case of why the things that we're finding are important. And at some point, audit may have to draw a line in the sand and just say, no, you know, for your operations, for what you're trying to do, you can't just accept the risk on everything. You actually have to take some action to mitigate some of the problems that were found here. This requires us to have um, a little bit of courage sometimes going into these meetings with management to stand your ground. All of these things together, again, are red flags that there's a potential cultural issue. Because what we're talking about is management's behaviors in a bad situation. Nobody wants to be in an audit report. Nobody wants to have issues to deal with. But the way that management reacts can go one way or another. They can look at this as, OK, yes, I need to make some changes, make some quick improvements. I can work with the audit department. We can, we can work together to solve an issue. Or they can become really defensive, really aggressive, take it out on their people. And that's going to be a red flag that there's a cultural issue going on, specifically in that group that we're talking to. Last one of our phases for this portion, talking about issue follow-up. Because now we're, we're, we're past the audit. We're in some follow-up phase. We're, we're looking at how issues trend over time. We're looking at things and how they've been closing out. So are we finding that the audit issues that we put out there are never addressed? So maybe management just played along while we were in the audit. But once we got down the road, they just threw the audit report in the trash and moved on with their lives. They never talked about it. They never dealt with it. 
or they're just not meeting the agreed upon dates. Maybe they do it, but they do it really reluctantly. And they ask for lots of extensions, and then eventually they do it. Are they completely ignoring all of our communication? Now, we're, maybe we're asking for status updates every so often, or we're, we're sending them emails throughout, just, you know, just making sure you're still on track. Is there anything you need from us? Do we need to clarify anything at all? Anything. Do we get any kind of response back from them at all? Now, with all of that in your head, thinking through all of these different phases of an audit of how you may have seen management act and behave and attitudes you may have seen from management and the processes that they follow while you're out in the audit, our next question is, have you observed any of these red flags? So your options are going to be, yeah, we see this stuff. We see it pretty frequently. Maybe it's, it's, it's fairly pervasive. Or sometimes you see it, but you see it maybe in specific areas. It's not all the time. You never see it. You don't have this issue, or you're not sure. second poll is launched. Have you observed any of these red flags? Please take a moment to record your answer. We have a number of questions that have come in. Trying to keep up with them here, Toby. Is one that came in here. We have a newly established internal audit department and have had so much pushback due to a strong culture of resistance. We're trying to change that. What tools, tips, or tricks do you suggest we employ? That's a great one. Um, I would say some of the initial things that you can do are going to be around partnership and communication. Um, if you work very closely with management, even in scoping out some of the initial things you do with those first few audits to show that you're a partner with them, it's really hard for them to object to you doing a lot of the work if they were a part of it. Um, and, and same thing with communication. If you keep a very open line of communication and show that we're partnering with them to make it better, that'll help. Um, at some point, it's gonna, it, it just requires some backbone from leadership to stand up and say, here's how it's going to be, especially with pushback on issues. In a lot of new departments, what we see out in the field is they'll issue reports and management just does not act. They might go through the closing meeting, they might get to that point, and then they just don't do anything. And that requires strong management, strong leadership to stand up and say, look, you have to do these things. We agree to them. They have to be done on this timeline. And we, we will be including all the updates in the, in the audit committee presentation to make sure that they know that they're, they're being held to these things and it's not something that no one's going to know about. Great. Okay, we've got 96% uh, that have voted, so we're going to go ahead and close the poll, share the results. Back to you, Toby. Yeah, these, these results are pretty much, this has been my experience too. So it's, it's over 90% of us have seen this. This is, is really going to be just the, the way that, we always wrote it off as the way that audit gets treated, you know. And we even talk, calling it, call it things like I was treated like an auditor when I was in the field, you know. But you're still an employee of this company, you know. You're still working with everybody here, and if they treat you that way, there's a good chance they treat their own people that way. And that's why this is a red flag indicator that there's a, there's a bigger underlying problem in this culture. So let's let's turn the page on this. We've been talking about everything that we see. Now let's look at specific audits, and we're going to run through a couple to give you some ideas on how we might apply this in an audit. Let's start with an HR audit. So we're going out, we're looking at HR operations. We're going to be looking at things like um, some employee files, maybe some of it's held to regulations, making sure that files are complete, 
Um, we might look at some hiring, termination practices, things like that. So one test, an actual test we can run, because this isn't all just going to be things you see, might be taking out your analytics tool and looking at new hire uh, files for demographics. Who are we hiring? If you look through all the demographics of your recent hires, maybe like the last three, four, five years, is it stacked against one group? Do you have only people of one race, only people of one gender being hired? Everybody came from one college. Maybe that's the only college in town. Maybe that's legit. But think about how things stack against each other. Do you have racial profiling going on inside of your organization? We all like to think that we're better than that, but do we? You can take the data that you come back out with and you can compare it to national averages, to local averages, compare it to other companies in your industry. This is information that's fairly readily available out on the internet. So you can do some quick comparisons to see, do we have anything in our data that would point to a potential red flag? The next would be to look at things like hotlines. First question is, do you have a hotline? Anything, fraud hotline, ethics hotline, whistleblower hotline, anything of that nature. If you do have one, do you only have one because you're a public company and SOC says you have to have one? Is this something that only exists on paper where you have a hotline but no one watches it? So things to look for. Look for response times. As people post in any kind of issues, any discrepancies, any concerns, did we follow up on them? If we did, did we actually follow all the way through or is it something we started and just dropped? And then also look at, at things around retaliation. Most of these hotlines allow anonymous tips. If they're anonymous, they may have stayed that way the whole way through and everything is fine. Sometimes people will, e even in these calls where they're supposed to be anonymous, they'll type in their name, they'll type in, they'll say their name if it's a phone call. Was there any retaliation against this person? You probably have a policy that says you don't, but then what really happened? Were they retaliated against? The other is through termination processes. This is a good one because we're talking specifically about behaviors. And like I said at the beginning, behavior shows itself in the best of times and worst of times. So if this is the worst thing possible is you fire someone, how was that person treated? Were they, were they treated with dignity? Or did we make them do a walk of shame where they, they were given a box to clean out their desk in the middle of the day with everybody watching, and we made them do this walk of shame through the office then toss them out into the street? How did we treat this person who's been working for our company? At the end of this, we might send out an email blast to people to let them know that, you know, Bob's no longer with the organization. And that might not be a bad thing. You know, we can do this with, with a certain aspect that says, we'd like to thank Bob for his years of service. Wish him best on his next endeavor. Or, Bob was let go for X, Y, Z reasons, and if you do it too, you're next. What kind of emails get sent out around these things? And there's a tone to them that's pretty, pretty obvious usually. These would be red flags that we look for that go, maybe we start with an HR audit to see what the processes look like, but then see what they really look like in the organization. And that can point to underlying problems within our culture that we lack respect for our employees. We don't treat people very well. Our next example is gonna be a compensation audit. Now what we're talking about is looking at pay. This is usually a pretty data heavy area. So we have numbers that we can look at. So we can run more tests. There's also some things that we can look at that might be inappropriate. So let's start with a test, just like last time. I can run an analytical evaluation on the, on the data to see are people being paid evenly at all. Gender bias and pay is in the news every single day right now. Go out to any news uh, outlet. They all have articles on gender bias and pay right now. Same thing. We all want to think that the organization we work for would never do this. But it's pretty easy to find out. Go test it. And this can also be something that's kind of hard to judge. This is going to involve some demographic information. Um, we'd even say go beyond just gender. Look at things around race. Look at, look at things around age, because there can be ageism and discrimination in age. It can be the same thing around race, same thing around gender. Where it can be tricky is you might have established bans for pay inside of your organization. Most of us do. But then look at the way that people distribute throughout a band. 
So if you've got a band, let's say directors are paid anywhere between $50,000 and $150,000. And we run our analytic and all the men are paid at 150, all the women are paid at 50. Well, $100,000 swing in pay is life changing. And that's something that we should be looking into if we have clear racial or, gen or gender or any other kind of discrimination in the different levels. And it's going to require some interpretation. The other would be looking at the other side of pay, which is usually something around bonuses that get paid out. So any other kind of pay that's out there, look for the metrics that are used to judge that type of pay. Are they all skewed to favor one group of any kind? Or are the metrics that do exist set up that might create pressures for fraud? So have we established basically a cutthroat environment? We always go back to the example um, where we have you know, organizations that are out there that have really great policies, but then in practice don't follow them. Or they have really great policies, but then the way that those actually get disseminated to the people, or the way that we actually act on them, they don't, they don't jive with the way that the policy was written. In practice, they're much, much more aggressive. One more. And this is going to be looking through some of the questions that were answered early on or asked early on, too. This might kind of get into some of this, too. For our last example, we want you to look in the mirror. Look at the audit department. Before you start going and talking about other people's culture, you should look at your own. One of the quotes from one of the articles here, this was from uh, one called Organizational Culture Evolving Approaches. It says that we need to look at ourselves first. That internal audit needs to be conscious of its own culture and behaviors and how we're perceived. Because what we're doing internally could completely destroy our credibility when we go out in the field if we start trying to bring up these issues. You have to be doing this stuff at home first. So think about yourselves in a, as a department. And this might not go down to the level of like a QAR, QAIP, self-assessment kind of thing. We're talking about soft skills inside of your department and some that are going to be more policy driven. So for one, things like your, like your processes. Have you ever written down how you perform audits or the methodology that you use to do a risk assessment? Are you actually following formalized procedures or on, on, at least on the surface, does it look like we're winging it every day? Have we hired people who are appropriately trained. So are people encouraged to get certifications? Do we then support those certifications with CPE credit? Like do we allow them to go out and get training? Because that's going to impact the quality of the work that we do if we're not even allowed to go out and stay current with, with what we're doing. Internally, do you have a willingness to admit when we make mistakes? I know it's hard to believe, but auditors are not perfect. And sometimes we report things that weren't quite right. And I've even personally had to experience this where I, I put something into an audit report and had to go back and do a retraction because some of the data that I saw, I misinterpreted. And it didn't come out until like a month after the audit report was out because then the, the, the group went back and started digging through what I, we did, doing some retesting, and their results were different. And they came back and showed us why. So we have to say, no, I made a mistake. And that's okay because we're asking them to admit their mistakes. So we have to do it too. Are we secretive in our testing, in our reporting techniques? If you come out with an audit issue and you say that we tested a something and I found these problems, they're going to want to see it. Show it to them. This shouldn't be a secret. You should hand it right over to them and say, yeah, here's how I pulled the sample. Here's how I did my test. Here's the results that I found. You can't fix it if you don't explain how they did it. Plus, when we start talking about this in a bigger picture, ultimately we want management to take on some of this testing on their own. They should be more proactive with some of these things. If we show them how we did it, we can hand them that. And then finally, are we acting as just checklist auditors? Or even worse, are we just seen as a policy police? We don't want to ever be, be viewed in a way that, you know, audit doesn't add value to what we're doing. They just come through, they write up a couple of things, and they leave. They run through with a bunch of checklists, standard audit program every year, and never look at what we're doing, never actually talk to us. We should always be taking a risk-based approach specific to the processes that people are following. If we're not doing these things, if we haven't formalized our processes, if we had never ever admit to mistakes and are secretive in everything we do and don't show that, that there's any value in us doing whatever we, it is that we do, these are going to be red flags for ourselves. This is showing that we have a culture internally in our department 
that we probably don't want to have. And we need to address these things. Now with all of that, talking about how we can approach this from our perspective, just performing audit engagements, specific engagements where we can include some testing for red flags that might lead us to cultural issues. The big question becomes, can you write these things down? Now, the stance that we're going to take on this is that, yes, you have to write them down. But I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second and show you some of the things that go wrong. So the pros and cons to writing these things down. The pros are, if we don't write them down, they're never going to get addressed. People only ever respond to things and deal with things you write down. You can't look for patterns if you don't write them down. We have to keep a record of what we saw, what we found, what it looked like out in the field, or, or else we won't be able to track them down. And then finally, we want the board to know what's going on internally and with the organization that they have oversight for. If you don't write them down, they don't go into the audit report. They don't go into the audit report, they don't go into the audit committee summary. And the board has no idea what's going on right under their nose. So we need to get these in writing to get them up the chain. On the flip side, it may feel like we're singling people out. And this is new for us. We don't do this. We talk about processes. We talk about controls. We, do, we don't call people out for doing something wrong. In this case, we might be. So we may actually have to single people out. And when we do that, that's going to add some tension. Management might immediately start to dread having the auditors come through. So when we do this, we have to do this in a way that's going to be palatable for everyone. So this gets into our unique challenges. People are going to get defensive when we do this. When we start writing down the issues that we find, management may completely agree with you when you're in the field. They might say, yeah, we did that. Yeah, I was pretty mean to Bob when we fired him. I was mad at him for what he did, so I made him do a walk of shame. But when you write it down, now it goes to everybody. And now everybody sees that, that we did this, and now they're going to get defensive. The issues could be open to misinterpretation, so we have to make sure that we are very, very clear and concise in what we see and what we're writing down. We need to talk about behaviors and attitudes, not people. This is just going to get right back into the way that we've always done things of talking about processes and controls, but now we're talking about attitudes and behaviors. Not people, not specifics, unless it needs to be specifics, in which case then we have to word them very carefully and just be prepared for backlash. The other challenges are with us. I know I was never trained to do this. I'm assuming of everybody on the phone, there's very few, if anyone, who has a master's degree or PhD in psychology who's now an internal auditor. Maybe there are a couple, but if you're not in that group, you were probably never trained for this. Documenting these kind of soft issues and looking for soft skills like this is not something that we've always been taught to do. We're typically going out and auditing against the standard. We audit against the policy. We audit against the regulation. Now we're looking at the way we do things around here and seeing if that's appropriate. So you're going to be making a lot of judgment calls. And you're judging against social norms. So with some of this, we're going to be writing things down that are subjective. There's not going to be a ton of evidence. The metrics might not be apparent other than it does not feel right. So I need to say something. Now if you're just completely uncomfortable with this, and that's OK to admit that we're completely uncomfortable with this, our answer might be to go outside the organization. Look for, for, for some subject matter expert out there who has specialties in this. Uh, you can look to your, your external auditor, look to your, if you're partnering with Big Four or somebody like that, and see what their suggestions are. Maybe this is something that we need to outsource to them, just because we don't want to create a lot of tension between our two groups, especially like we had the one comment earlier, if you're a new department, and you're trying to take some of these things on, we might need to start small, do some documentation, do some reporting, and, and ease into it or outsource it, just to, to keep the tensions low. The reason I think we have to write these things down is because ultimately we need to get these up the ladder. We need to get these, these concerns that we have up to an audit committee level. Because if we're, our job is to present things to management, to senior management, to the board, so that they understand what's going on inside of their, or their organization, cultural issues present a new risk that they may not be aware of. And if we don't write them down, we can't report them. 
ultimately what we're trying to get to might be something like this, where we say, we've been doing our audits, we've been documenting our issues, we did a root cause analysis, and here's where things fall out. This many of our, our issues were tied to segregation of duties or to system access or management review breakdown. And this many were tied to cultural issues. And then we're probably going to have to go into some detail of what it is that we saw. Is it a problem? Not a problem? Is it a localized issue? Is it a global issue? What are we seeing? Now, I know that's a lot of information. And at this point now, I just want your opinion. With all that in your head, do you think that we should be doing this? Do you think that we should be including culture in our audit plan? So yeah, you think we should. You think it should be part of your, your annual audit plan, something you're doing internally. Yeah, you think we should, but you don't want to do it. You think this is probably something we should outsource to somebody else. Or no, we shouldn't, or you're still just not sure. I've launched that poll. Toby, this is, this is fantastic. Uh, you might want to go through some of the questions that have been posed. There have been a number, as I expected, based on the, the size of our audience. But a lot of great questions out there. Uh, if you can see the questions, uh, you might want to pick a few out and try to address them. Yeah, here, this is why I love this one. It's just the question, there's more of a statement. It says, for multicultural corporation, the cultural issues are also driven by local values and customs. And the same processes can yield different results. That's a fantastic observation, because that's really the heart of what we're driving for here, is that there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. And that's why that, that statement from, from earlier on, that we should be doing this on every engagement to look for early warning signs is important. We can't inconsistently do these types of things. We have to take, I really do see this as an all or nothing. So we go into every engagement looking at culture and looking for red flags, but you're perfectly right. You have to have that cultural understanding of the group you're looking at. Because what's acceptable in one area, especially one part of the world, would be completely unacceptable somewhere else. So if we're in the Middle East doing an audit, the way that things happen there may be completely acceptable within their culture and entirely against something that would be acceptable to Western, Western culture. doesn't mean it's a problem. It's a local issue. It's a local cultural custom. OK, let me go ahead and close the poll and share the results. I think you'll find this interesting, Toby. Glad, glad to see this. So a lot of people are interested in it, or interested in taking it on themselves, or at least partnering with someone else to get it done. Um, it's going to be a challenge, but it always is when we take on a new topic. It was, a, it was the same thing when we started looking at IT things for the first time. It was the first time if you've never done deep financial auditing. The first time you do it, it's always difficult. So hopefully, what we can give you then are going to be some good resources. Here's the ones I used. So if you're looking for some place to go, these were the best ones that I read. Um, Auditing culture, a hard look at the soft stuff, really gets into um, why we need to look at culture and some, some very, very high level approaches. Um, they're mostly suggesting to take it on as an audit, like a specific engagement to go out and, and do a culture audit. I disagree with that approach. I think it's something that needs to be more pervasive. Um, but the idea behind that one's really good. The Pulse of Internal Audit Survey highlights the reasons why. So it gets into, the, into the, the numbers behind it all, that behaviors impact culture. Culture can take down an organization. Um, the next one, Organizational Culture Evolving Approaches, and even more so, the blog that Norman Marx wrote on it, his response to that article. I found the two together to be really insightful. Um, the article itself is, again, pretty high level. Uh, but Norman Marx's response to it breaks it down to some pieces and shows his what he thinks is going to come of this sort of long term. Like how, how is this going to play out in the next few years? Um, and the last one, culture and the role of internal audit, that one's more concrete. So that's getting more into specifics. Here's things we need to look at, areas to, to address. Um, these, these together, if you, if you just take any one of the, these names, 
and throw it into Google. It'll be the first thing that pops up as the PDF. Um, so they're all really good resources. You can probably skim them all in like half an hour. Um, longer if you want to read all the details. But you can get the gist of all of them pretty quickly. So take, take a minute and look at them all. And then last, um, if you're looking for some other things, we do write a blog on this. So I have a blog posted at teammatesolutions.com slash blog where we take on just all audit topics. Nothing's off limits. We talk about everything. Um, and then teammatesolutions.com slash leadership is more about technology, some bigger papers, white papers on how to do a lot of these things. And with our last few minutes, I want to run through some of these questions because I'm reading some of these and they're great. Um, and this is, I, I love this one. It says, my organization would be interested in the criteria for this type of work. How do you select the appropriate ideal state? Um, what, I'm, what I'm hearing from this question is that you can't really define what the right way to do a lot of these things are. And, you know, when we talk about the risk of something, if we do step back and say that um, culture is a risk that we should be including in our assessments, it's some it's talking about the risk culture of an organization even, which there's lots and lots of, um, commentary on that at the moment of what a risk culture is and our appetite and tolerance for risk. The ideal state uh, is kind of hard to define and it's going to be based on where you are in the world, based on where you are in a country, based on the um, level of maturity of the organization and it's going to be something that you just know. If something doesn't feel right, that's where we start to bring it up as a problem. Um, and you can look at a lot of the organizations uh, that have failed. Look at groups like Enron, who is a very clear record of what went wrong, how things broke, because a lot of their problems were cultural. They had world-class policies written on how to deal with things, and then they didn't follow them all, and culture took them down. So go back and, and look at some of those things that went poorly for people and see how we can make them better. The next one was, here's another one. It says, has there been a positive improvement in the culture of an organization after reporting on an audit of, uh, an audit of culture? I would imagine results would put management in a highly defensive front. Um, I'll tell you, one thing that we did, uh, we sort of, this was, this was not our intention to do this, but it's something that we did in practice. Um, my, last, my last role in audit, at the end of every audit, we did an evaluation of how the entire audit went. Um, we did take the results of the audit report, and what we did was we looked at the entire audit under the format of the five big elements of COSO. So you know, we had tone at the top, we had our control environment, we had risk assessments, communication everywhere, and we went through each one of those big elements and said, how did the audit perform against any of these elements? And our, our control environment was mostly driven as a score based on the audit report. But we had a fairly subjective tone at the top kind of category where we talked about things like this. Was management receptive? Were they aggressive? Did they argue? Did they stick us in the basement? You know, what did they do to us? And a few times we'd have scores on the overall audit that looked like they were much harsher than they should have been based on those just plain audit ratings, like the issues that were in the report. And there were times when we presented that back to management. And those conversations were not usually led by the manager on the audit. They were typically held by the chief audit executive with us in the room with management. Because she would come in and act as you know, an independent observer of what happened. And here's what the audit team is telling me. Here's what you guys have been rated because of this. And here's the reasons why. And after one really bad session where we had to, you know, everyone sat in a room very uncomfortable going through this, the improvement between those departments, between us and that group, was amazing. Because at that point, they said, yeah, we haven't been treating you guys right. You know, we were pushing back unnecessarily. I do understand why you're here. No, we don't hate audit. So it, it opened up some communications, and it was hard. Like that, that initial run through of what we found that was a part of their, their, their process and how they treated us. It was a really uncomfortable conversation. But then things got much, much better.
here we go. This one says, my team has been continuously applying internal audit marketing techniques like advocacy, issuing alerts in order to improve management partnership. If the impact is not satisfactory, what else can we do? Um, I think that you've already started down the right path. And for any, I wanted to bring this one up, because anyone who's not doing these things, this can be a key, especially for those who are getting started. Um, just a basic awareness of what internal audit does to people, um, to you know, members of the organization. Uh, so that they understand that here's what the internal audit department is for, here's what we do, here's how we do it, um, here's who's on staff so you know what, you know them whenever you see them because you might not see them all the time. Um, issue some alerts that go out there like if you, something's coming up in the news, send out a blast. You know, there's something that, that's showing up on CNN in the morning about some cybersecurity issue, there's some uh, worm that's out there that's taking everybody out. Send something really quickly to your, to your IT group and say, hey, have you guys dealt with this? We're not auditing you. We just want to know if you're, if you're dealing with this. Just an awareness. Um, being that level of a partner is going to go a long way. To go past that, again, open communication. That's going to be the key to everything on this, is you have to be willing to talk to people and have, have sometimes those awkward conversations about what it is you do. Um, if you're looking for some examples on how to do these things, go out to any major university's website and look up internal audits. Universities do a fantastic job of advocacy for themselves within their internal audit departments of making sure that people know who they are and what they do. Um, I think on Cornell a lot. Uh, Cornell has a fantastic website for internal audit that shows their plan, shows everybody what they're doing, complete transparency. Now, if you take a look at anything like that, you can see how people present themselves to their organizations. One question was something specific um, on one of the topics we talked about. Would, would an audit of pay be subjected to legal, legal discovery? Um, would this something that would ultimately fall under like uh, attorney-client privilege? It might. Um, this is going to be something that, because we're getting into something that could potentially be a legal issue, we can raise it, we can raise our concern. We have a red flag that we've uncovered if we find something there. Um, typically, what works from an audit perspective is if we get the data without names, with now something that's, that's identifiable to us, but it is identifiable back to the, the people who are responsible for these types of things. So maybe like an employee number that's fairly generic or an employee ID of some kind, so that whenever you start running through the analytics and you start flagging some things and you can point to things from a demographic standpoint and say, because of these two outputs, I think we have a problem. And then you give that back to them in a way that's not, um, you're not putting in a lot of identifiable information. It helps to illustrate the point. And so from an audit point of view, we've done our job. After that, it may take on a life of its own. At that point, it may be something that goes up to senior management fairly quickly. And it might fall under some legal privilege. So that's something that I imagine that would be case by case, um, especially depending on the level of corporation you might be in or organization you might be in. Um, so don't be surprised if it does. There was a question, are there any formal procedure steps available for auditing cultural issues? This is something Jim and I were talking about just right before the call. There's not a lot out there. Um, from an audit net perspective, Jim's looking at some of this now. Uh, we were, we're doing some on, on our own as well at Team Atrium to look for some, some guidance that's out there. It is very hard to find. Um, I think a lot of this is something that people are just trying out for the first time. Uh, from, from our perspective, you know, going through this, we're trying to present some initial things around red flags. Anything from a red flag, the inverse is a test. I can look for something. Maybe it's just a, an awareness type of a thing, just like we do with, with, with fraud, to have some awareness of red flags. Some specific tests will come out of this. So we give a couple of examples, like looking at pay, looking at distributions of new hires, things like that. I think there's a huge opportunity for audit programs on this that are going to help all of us a lot. Um, I know I have uh, a contact internally who's um, just recently, we've been talking through a lot of these things, and he's looking to write audit programs to distribute to people. Uh, so anything that's out there, I think at this point, it's going to be a lot of team sharing between everyone. Um, and even Jim, if you had any comments on that one. 
uh, about actually putting some things down. Yeah, Toby, that's that's a great point, and I've already been doing some research on this. And you know, if anybody has any ideas that they want to share, you know, send them along. Uh, also, Toby and I will be at the international conference for the IIA, and I'm sure that this topic will come up in some of the sessions. So, any material that we get and we can share, we'll uh, we'll dead. Definitely put it up on uh, on AuditNet, and I'm sure the teammate will share it through Teammate Connect. So there there should be more. But this is a, an entirely new area, something that auditors are trying to deal with, and it crosses over into so many areas that that we're already dealing with. But uh, I think it's a it's a great great area for for sharing information, and I think the concept of uh, you know multinational corporations and you know dealing with different cultures and it's going to raise whole whole new questions for the international and the national audit community so you know this this has been great toby i think this is one of the best sessions that we've ever had and based on based on the number of people that uh, that have signed into this and the number of questions that we got i'm sorry if we weren't able to answer all of your questions we we really we must have received several hundred questions that uh, that are out there and toby had to pick and choose which ones uh, he could address so thank you toby for a great session if you want to say anything in closing please feel free otherwise I want to wish everybody a, a great day, and uh, we look forward to you coming back to more of these events in the future. Yeah, just thanks, everyone, for coming. Really appreciate all the comments. And like Jim said, we'll try to get back to some of these because there's, there's a lot. So we're going to try to get through as many of these as we can and give people some responses back. Fantastic. Thanks, all, and have a great day.